Hey everybody, so today we're going to look specifically at a rhetorical analysis question for the AP English Language and Composition Constructed Response portion of the exam, which is traditionally Section 2. So the question we're going to be using as our sample is the 2002 Form B question. I will link um, this below so that you can access this if you need to, but you can also follow along on screen. So in addition to that, we are going to be looking at three student responses and the scoring commentary following them. The student responses are effective responses, so all three of them would be passing, and so those would serve as a model showing how you can write your own rhetorical analysis. The focus of my walk through the prompt today is mainly going to be on pre-writing, because when you are writing on demand, you have 40 minutes, and that's your suggested time. But when you are writing on demand, pre-writing is more important than it will be in any other writing situation. Good pre-writing will lead to a strong essay. If you don't pre-write at all, or if you don't give pre-writing the attention that it needs, your essay will likely be disorganized. In addition to that, you may not discover what your best idea is until you are very nearly out of time. So pre-writing helps us to finish the task and overall to write a better essay. So let's go ahead and look at the prompt. So it says the suggested time is 40 minutes, counting for one third of the total essay section score. That's typical, um, except for in 2020, as you know, um, that is a little bit different. Um, in that this is the only question, but typically that's what we're going to see. So let's look at the prompt. It says, below are excerpts from a crucial scene in Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. Calpurnia, Caesar's wife, has dreamt that Caesar will be murdered and tries to persuade him to remain at home where he will be safe. Decius, a member of a group of conspirators, tries to persuade Caesar to go to the Senate where the conspirators plan to kill him. Read the excerpts carefully, then write an essay in which you analyze the rhetoric of both arguments and explain why you think that Caesar finds Decius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnia's. You may want to consider such elements as choice of detail, use of appeals, and understanding of audience. Now. The wording of the rhetorical analysis prompt is going to be variable, and the text excerpts that you will analyze will be variable. This one in particular is a pre-modern text, so we can expect to see either pre-modern or contemporary. You're going to see a pre-modern text on the exam somewhere. Now, it's not very often that we see plays on the AP English Language and Composition exam, However, it does happen, so we have to be prepared for anything that we might see. Now, most often what you will see in the rhetorical analysis question, as far as the text goes, is typically a letter or a speech. So, but again, be prepared for anything. Now let's look at what the prompt is asking us to do. So this is before, notice, before I even get into the text itself. I'm already starting my pre-writing, and in my pre-writing, what I'm doing is looking at what is the prompt asking me to do. So it says, write an essay in which you analyze the rhetoric of both arguments. Let's stop there. So rhetoric, we know, is the way in which speakers or writers use language to persuade. To persuade. So my task is to analyze the rhetoric of these two characters' arguments, Decius and Calpurnia. However, we need to make sure that we do not misunderstand the question. If we misunderstand the question, we can write what we think is a really strong essay, but it might not pass, because part of the task is understanding what the question is asking us. And there is going to be some nuance to that, meaning, that it's not always going to be straightforward. Because the AP English language exam is trying to measure your ability to think and write like a college student. 
It's trying to measure whether you deserve college credit, whether you are writing as if you have taken an entire college class already, uh, which our curriculum is designed to mirror. So where is the nuance here? Well, one of the places is that it says why you think Caesar finds Dezius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnius. This means that I'm not only analyzing the rhetoric of both arguments. If I do that alone, I'm not fully answering the question. What I need to do is explain with detail and support why Caesar finds Dezius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnius. Now, this is helpful because it doesn't ask us to determine which argument is more persuasive. It tells us, it tells us whose is more persuasive, according to Caesar, and that's Dezius. So we already know that. We don't have to interpret that from the te text. So we, our task then is to analyze why is Dezius's argument more persuasive. That's what we have to do. That is our prompt. So in my pre-writing, the first part of my, pro my thesis will be a response to the prompt. So the first part of my thesis will answer that question, why I think Caesar finds Dezius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnius. So if you follow my cursor right here, this is the first part of your thesis. Caesar finds Dezius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnius because. Now you've got to figure out what comes after the because, but that's the first part. It's given it to us. So that's a little, that, that simplifies it a little bit. Now the next thing that I'm going to think about before I even move on to that last sentence of my prompt is that I am thinking ahead of time about structure. I'm thinking ahead of time about how I'm going to organize my essay. So in my pre-writing, I want to write a thesis, and it can be a loose thesis that may change, but it needs to have a position in response to the prompt, and it needs to have a summary of the reasons that I think that position is true. That summary of those reasons, those are what I'm going to develop in my body paragraphs. So I'm going to have my thesis. I am then going to have my anticipated text structure. So for this one, what you can do, and it will give you more to write about, is to explain in what's called block format. First, why Caesar finds Dezius's argument the most persuasive. Second, why is Calpurnia's not as persuasive? So really, this is like a comparison and contrast essay but it gives us a lot of room to, to share our ideas. So again, our thesis is, Caesar finds Dezius' argument more persuasive than Calpurnius because, and then I'm gonna fill in those blanks from my reading, and my text structure is going to be my first block, which might take one long paragraph, it might take two, it might take three, it might take four, it doesn't matter. It means the first section of the essay, it's gonna be a block. My first block is gonna say why Dezius's argument is more persuasive with evidence. Then I'm going to transition to the next part. The next part will say, on the other hand, Calpurnia's argument is not as persuasive because. You will follow that with a conclusion. And that is your essay. Now, you should decide that before you read the text. Now, notice the thing I did not decide before I read the text. I did not decide what my reasons are going to be. I did not decide the topics of my body paragraphs because I haven't read the text yet, so I don't know them. But in summary, before you read the text, you need to have a working thesis statement that you might change after you read the text. It's possible. You need to have an anticipated text structure. Those two things. Got it? All right, and so the next line of this prompt, this prompt gives us quite a bit, so that's helpful. It says, you may want to consider such elements as choice of detail, use of appeals, and understanding of, our, of audience. Now, the, the rhetorical analysis question is not always going to tell you what you may want to consider. Many times you have to figure it out on your own. 
So this one, it is handy that it does this. So you can look for those things, but it says you may want to consider. So you're not limited to talking about those, but if you can't decide what you want to write about, you can certainly write about the use of detail, the use of appeals, persuasive appeals. This is our uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos is appeal to authority or credibility. Logos is use of logic and reasoning. And pathos is appeal to emotion, making the audience feel emotion. Finally, understanding of audience. This is part of the rhetorical triangle. If you've studied the Aristotelian triangle, you know that how the audience interacts with the subject and the speaker is how we reveal the message and purpose. So my advice would be maybe don't try to write about understanding of audience. I kind of feel like that is a red herring. A red herring is something that's meant to distract you. Because unless you've taken a course in Shakespeare, what are you going to say about this audience? It would be very easy to just pick those three and be like, okay, I have my three body points. I'm good. Let me start writing. What are you going to say about the audience? So use of appeals in detail, I think would be good, but let's see what else we can find. And also in the student responses, we'll see what they found and we'll analyze that. So I'm going to go through the text with you now. Let's read it together. Calphurnia. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There is one within. Besides the things that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons in right form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal up about the streets. O oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. Now, as I read this, I'm in a note take. Now, this type of language can be expected from our pre-modern text. So somewhere in the exam, we're going to see language like this that is um, either archaic or in some way different from the language we speak routinely on a daily basis. So navigating that language is part of what the test is measuring. Can you do that? But what do I know? I know that Calpurnia, this is my section two of my essay and talking about why this argument is not as persuasive to Caesar. So what is this argument doing? Well, one thing that I see is a lot of pathos, a lot of appeal to emotion. What is one of the appeals to emotions include fe includes fear. So it's saying, um, She's, she's using this imagery, descriptive language, to evoke fear in Caesar, right? So I could jot that down, pathos, imagery. Both of those things are ways in which the author uses language. Pathos, imagery, evoking emotion, evoking fear. And Caesar replies, what can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. So this, you don't necessarily have to comment on what Caesar says, but it looks like right here, he's just saying these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. So he's saying like, these predictions aren't very specific to me. Like he basically he's saying, I'm not afraid. I'm not convinced. I'm not worried about what you have to say. And then Calpurnia says, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Okay, so it looks like in this, um, using metaphor, the heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. This character is saying that the signs or omens, which is what this passage is about, it's about omens. This character is saying that when regular people die or beggars or non-important people, according to this worldview, there aren't any signs or omens from the heavens, but when someone important like a prince or like Caesar dies or is in danger, there will be these signs. So that's interesting. And I could even jot that down. I don't really know what it means yet though. 
And then he replies, Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. So basically he's saying, I'm not afraid of death. Now already I can tell you, those are the reasons. This is my, my, my section two of my essay, the reasons that this argument is not as effective. This argument is not as effective as Decius's because Caesar is not convinced by the character's use of pathos. Calpurnia uses pathos to try to make him afraid. And what does he say? He says, these predictions are general to the world. I don't believe them. I don't believe they affect me. And then Calpurnia tries to convince him. Calpurnia is like, oh, you don't believe them. Well, you know that these omens show up for princes and you're an important person, so you should be afraid. And he's like, well, maybe so, but I'm not afraid of death anyway. So what would I do then in that paragraph? I would have to articulate that idea in the topic sentence. Calpurnia's argument is not as effective to Caesar because the character's use of imagery and the character's use of pathos to scare Caesar does not work. Caesar does not believe in the omens, and then I could give text evidence supporting that. Right here. These predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. I could say that. I could quote it. In addition, he says, I'm not afraid of death. He says, death is a necessary end that will come when it will come. And I would quote those two segments. Then the character says, alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate house and he shall say, you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. So now the character is saying, well, I'm afraid. Um, and let's take a look at the footnote. Okay. So your wisdom is consumed in confidence. There's a three there. So that tells me that there's going to be a footnote. And what does it say? Destroyed by too much confidence. Oh, and look at this. I neglected to point this out to you earlier where it said stood on ceremonies, that footnote, it tells you what it means. Paid attention to omens. So if you didn't catch that without me saying it, there's a footnote there giving that to you. That is evidence demonstrating why you should pay attention and read closely and look at the footnotes for sure. Um, destroyed by too much confidence. So she's saying you're too proud. Um, you're too proud and I'm worried, so let's make this excuse so you don't go out today. And what does he say? He agrees. So he says, Mark Ant Antony shall say, I am not well, and for thy humor, I will stay at home. All right, now here comes Theseus. What does Caesar say? Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statue, which, like a fountain with a hundred spouts, did run pure blood, and many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warning's importance, and evil's imminent, and on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. This is an excellent um, piece of dialogue right here, because basically what it does is it tells you, it interprets the previous excerpt in case that you didn't understand exactly what's going on. Caesar just repeated to this character what just happened and we learned that she's his wife. So knowing this, you could actually say um, something about understanding of audience. And it did mention that here too, that she was his wife. So that was a detail that I missed. But if you choose to write about details or understanding of audience, if we look at Caesar as being the audience of Calpurnia's warning, we could say that she has the ability perhaps to be more persuasive because she is his wife. But ultimately, we know from the prompt that he decides not to agree with her as much as he does the other. So let's see what happens and why that is. So he says basically she dreamed and she had a vision that showed um, his death. Something bad is going to happen to him. 
And what does Dezius say? Dezius says, This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood, and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This, by Calpurnia's dream, is signified. Let's look. At our footnote, cognizance, mark, of identification worn by a nobleman's followers. Followers. This is very interesting. So what Dezius has done here is he's trying to say, oh, I believe you that she had this dream, but she did not interpret it right. Actually, what it means is that Rome will be revived through you. Through you. And he's basically saying, it signifies, which stands for, it, it's a sign of. So he's saying it's a metaphor for this idea that you are going to revive Rome with your greatness. So what's happening there? Um, he's appealing to Dezius, or Dezius is appealing to Caesar's ego. Yeah. And Caesar says, and this way, have you well expounded it? And he says, I have. When you have heard what I can say and know it now, the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word, you will not come. Their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, lo, Caesar is afraid. Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to your proceeding bids me tell you this and reason to my love is liable. So his advancement. And then Caesar says, How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia? I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my, give me my robe, for I will go. Now what has happened here? This is really interesting. Now seeing this, um, I would stick to our structural plan in that we're going to talk about why Calpurnia's argument is not persuasive and why Dezius is, is more persuasive. However, we are going to talk about Calpurnia first. So another thing we do in pre-writing is we decide the order, the order of our body paragraphs, the order of our points, okay? So because the text follows that Dezius is refuting Calpurnia's argument with this rebuttal and evidence saying, Oh, she may have had this vision, but she was wrong about what it meant. And on top of that, if you don't show up, they're going to think you're a coward and you're going to lose your advancement. You're going to lose your position in society. So what we're going to do then is we're going to talk about Calpurnia first, why it's not, and then why ultimately Dezius' argument is more um, persuasive to Caesar. So we're going to follow the order that the text follows. Now, I'm going to give you one piece of caution here. Make sure, do not try to talk about the play Julius Caesar outside of the excerpt. Don't do that, even if you've read it before. We don't want to pull in anything else. We want to stick to the task at hand. We need to support our thesis. We need to stay focused on the prompt. So even if you feel like you can pull in other things, don't do it. Even if you think you're familiar with the play, just don't do it. Um, we, want to, we want to stay with what's here. So now the last task that we had to do, remember in our pre-writing then, we've decided on the order. We've got our position. We need to decide on the reasons. We need to decide on the reasons that, that our position is true. So going back up to the prompt, why do you think Caesar finds Dezius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnia's? So Caesar finds Dezius's argument more persuasive than Calpurnia's because our first reason, he is not convinced by Calpurnia's imagery and attempts to scare him, period. At the same time, once he agrees to stay, Dezius refutes Calpurnia's interpretation of her dreams and he uses an appeal to Caesar's ego 
and an appeal to his position in society in order to convince him that he must go or be seen as a coward. So we have a two-sentence thesis. Now that was just a loose thesis. You might revise it to make it better, but this is on demand, meaning that the readers of your exam, they don't expect it to be perfect. They don't expect it to be perfect, but it does need to be well organized. Okay, so just to close up the pre-writing, um, and you should go more quickly than that. You should be done with your pre-writing for this in 10 minutes. That is very important. 10 minutes, and then you have 30 minutes to write, and you wanna leave yourself time at the end to go back and to revise and edit and put the finishing touches on your work. So 10 minutes for pre-writing, let's say 20 minutes for drafting, five minutes for revising, five minutes for editing plus what I call polishing. Now it's just a brief review. Revising, when I'm drafting, I just write. I just write according to my pre-writing plan. And then when I'm done writing and I've completed, like all of the parts are totally complete, introduction, both of those sections that we t discussed as our outline essentially, and um, a conclusion, it's complete. Then I go back to the top. So back to the top and I read through it again. I read through everything I wrote. And as I'm reading, I read for revision, not editing. Editing is changing grammar and mechanics. That's what a copy editor does in a newspaper. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking to revise. Revise is to add to where I didn't fully develop my ideas, to take away where I went off topic, to rearrange where my ideas are not in the best order, and to substitute. Typically to substitute where I need better word choice. When I'm trying to think of a word, I do not stop while I'm drafting. I wait. I can draw a line, a box, whatever. And just I just keep writing and then in revision I go back and then I hunt for the word in my mind. It's called a placeholder. So five minutes for revision and then five minutes for editing and polishing. Editing is then I go to the top again and I read through it for spelling, for grammar, for mechanics, for punctuation, correct capitalization, all of those things. So I don't worry about that when I'm revising either. So ultimately you're going to pre-write, you're going to then just write according to your plan, you're gonna go back to the top and you're gonna revise but not change spelling and all that yet. You're gonna then, when you finish revising, you're gonna go back to the top again and you're going to edit and finally polish. Polish is like cleaning up little errors, give it a title. It's like the very last things you need to do before you submit it. All right? If you follow that, then you won't be caught writing when your time is up and you will have a completed essay. So let's look then at some of the student samples. Of, why is she using a question from 2002? Um, if you've done any research writing, you know that best practices include using the most current research available. However, I have found that while the more recent AP English exam constructed response questions are useful to look at, all of them are useful to look at, we're more likely to see on a current exam a question that relates more directly to one from the past than one that was just administered. Because we can't expect that AP is going to give the same type of question every year. Now again, we don't know for sure. There's not a way to beat the AP exam. There aren't as many tricks for it even as there are for the ACT. But um, I have found value in looking at past exam questions, like even going way back. Now, the other thing you might be aware of is that the scoring rubric for the AP exam constructed response portion has changed as of 2020. So when we go over the student responses, the commentary is valuable, but the scores are not going to be the same. So all you need to worry about is if I say it's a passing paper or not a passing paper. 
Don't worry about the numbers because the numbers have changed this year. Now I will say that what AP is looking for in the essays, that has not changed. Just the rating system. So it is still valuable to see this old scoring commentary, even though the points you're going to get on your essays um, from 2020 and beyond, they're not going to correspond to that old AP rubric, which went from a score of zero to nine. Okay, or one to nine. All right. So, okay, let's go ahead and look at it. And again, this is linked below so you can access this document if you need to. So let's look at this first student's response. It says, in these excerpts from Julius Caesar, Caesar is being pulled in two directions at once. Calpurnia is attempting to make Caesar avoid making her nightmare come true. Decius, who knows that the nightmare is destined to come true, tries to persuade Caesar otherwise to fall into a trap. It is in an age, it is, it is an age-old unwritten law that husbands must listen with reverence to their wives. Calpurnia's audience is Caesar, and she knows, like modern-day wives, that he can be convinced if she persuades him enough. Her argument is simple. Her dream, the premonition that he will die and a lot of war and warriors would be present and ghosts come out of graves and walked around. She feels all of this has been shown to her because his death is approaching and she is afraid for him. In lines 19 to 21, she chooses to appeal by saying that nothing at all happens when a common man dies, but if and when he should die, the heavens themselves would blaze forth. So he, she underlined that for emphasis, or this student did, I don't know their gender, um, showing that if Caesar should die. When her arguments proved to be rather unsuccessful, as seen in Caesar's statement that death shall come when it will, she resorts to begging pleading for him to stay away from the Senate house that may lead to a fulfillment of her dreams just for the day. For Caesar, who throughout these excerpts is, I don't know what that says exactly, is something the audience, his wife has said what was needed, and in order to make her happy, he succumbs to her pleading argument and decides to remain at home. Then, Decius enters the picture. Decius, who Caesar does not know, is a traitor, who decides to begin his arguments, which, so Decius hopes, will lead Caesar on the trail to his death, Decius's arguments are all formulated out of lies to trick Caesar. First, to get Caesar's wife out of the picture, he refutes all that she has said and says her dream is a premonition for great things, happy things. The Romans won't wash their hands in Caesar's blood. They will be revived because of Caesar, and of course, his death is not near. The blood Calpurnia saw was nectar, sustenance that the Romans used for nourishment, not his death, but growth for the country. Decius then goes on to say that Caesar has received an award, a crown, that he will be presented with on that day, so he should show up. He says that if Caesar doesn't show, he is a chicken, afraid of something unknown. He builds Caesar up, convincing him of his greatness. The effectiveness of this argument is brought about by the buildup of Caesar's ego, trickery, and deceit. But it is successful because Caesar, the audience, likes this ego buildup and believes the lies of Decius. Okay, excellent.